All scripture is given by the inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all good works. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that ye may prove what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Welcome to Thinking Biblically. This is the 25th day of March in the year of our Lord, 2023. Continuing on with the series, Calvinism versus the Scripture. Today, I'm going to give the authors of the Westminster Confession of Faith the opportunity to defend biblically their, how do you put it, the eternal decree of all things. God's eternal decree of all things. Westminster Confession of Faith, chapter 3, paragraph 1. And here it is. I've highlighted the section that's relevant, the clause that is relevant. The rest of that paragraph is basically nonsense. A uh, assertion contrary to all logic. But a necessary assertion, not biblically necessary, but, well to try to soften the nonsense. Calvin himself referred to the eternal decree, especially the decree that Adam should sin, as the awful or dreadful decree of God. And indeed it is. But it's not God's decree. It's just the decree of theologians that impose it on the Scripture. So we will give the authors of this confession a chance to defend themselves Biblically, God, from all eternity, did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own free will, freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass, exhaustively, everything that comes to pass has been ordained, decreed by God, according to Calvinists. Yet so, as thereby neither is God the author of sin, nor is violence offered to the will of the creatures, nor is the liberty or contingency of second causes taken away, but rather established. So they assert. Well, today they will be in the dock and I will be asking them to defend themselves. <clears throat> How do they say the second part? So, as, as neither is God the author of sin. If God decreed all things, but yet he's not the author of sins, how do they do that? Well, it'd be like a, a woman that hires an assassin to murder her husband, claiming that she didn't actually murder her husband. That man did, that I hired. It's like David... Uh, I suppose, perhaps in his mind, thought that if he got rid of Bathsheba's husband by manipulating the circumstances that he would die in battle, that he really wasn't guilty of murder. Do you think God fell for that? I don't think so. Do you think God falls for this? No. Uh, so, we, But we will give them the opportunity now to answer for their assertion that God from all eternity did by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Just think of the awfulness of that decree. That God is indeed responsible for all the evil. God is indeed responsible for the fall of humanity into sin and all the evil that has come over the millennium as a result of that. What is their defense for their doctrine? Can they defend it from Scripture? Does the Scripture teach such a thing? Well, we'll examine them. We will examine their evidence today. That first clause is supported by 
four scriptures. Obviously, these, I think there was rank, uh, around 100, 120 of these Westminster divines, supposedly, clergy, bishops, uh, and also uh, secular lay people, uh, members of parliament, etc. Prestigious group. Their first proof of this doctrine, that the scripture teaches this, is Ephesians 1.11. So we will go over there and allow them to present their evidence. So I'll be using the, uh, let me use the King James, because that's what they used, undoubtedly. Uh, probably not the Geneva, probably the King James. <laughs> huh. So let's, we'll use that. <clears throat> the King James here, 1 Timothy, excuse me, Ephesians 1, 11, reads this, In whom also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him who works all things after the counsel of his will. Hmm. That could be saying what they say, perhaps. But what's the rule of biblical interpretation? Context, context, and context. So we will go up and look at what they're talking about. Predestined what and who? Starting at verse 3, Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. Excuse me. Blessed be the God and Father of, Lord, of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with all spiritual blessings in heavenly places in Christ. Now, that's a key word in Ephesians here, especially this first chapter. In Christ. He's writing to believers who are in Christ. To be saved is to be in Christ. According, according as he hath chosen us in him doesn't say us individually, it says chosen us in him, we who are in Christ, before the foundation of the world. Did he, Christ, exist before the foundation of the world? Yes, John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word. Christ is the Word, made flesh. And the Word was with God, and the Word was God. He was already existing, he always existed, he was there in the beginning, before the foundation of the world. In fact, he is the one who laid the foundation of the world. He has chosen us in him before the foundation of the world that we should be, chosen us for what purpose? Be holy, which really means belong to God, separated unto God, and without blame before him in love. I'm going to change the punctuation before him period. In love, by the way, there is no punctuation in the original Greek there. So this is arbitrary by the translators. So it just is not in the right place. Before him, in love having predestined us unto the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself. So this is talking about God's love to us in Christ predestined his people to the adoption of children by Jesus Christ to himself, as children of God, according to the good pleasure of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace. Now, who's, what's the grace of God? Jesus Christ and Christ crucified. The free gift of God, salvation as the free gift of God, that is his grace, wherein he has made us accepted, in the Beloved. In Christ we are accepted. The Beloved who died for our sins. Wherein he hath abounded, excuse me, in whom we have redemption through his blood, the cross, the forgiveness of sins. Through whom? In Christ. In, in him. According to the riches of his grace. For God so loved the world, he gave his only begotten Son. Jesus died for his enemies. 
while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. That's God's grace. God's will was not that we would be lost, not that we would be sinners, but he sent Christ to save us from that. Does that sound like God decreed the thing that he had to save us from? I don't know. Let's continue on with the context of verse 11 here. Wherein he hath abounded toward us in all wisdom and prudence, having made known unto us the mystery of his will, according to the good pleasure which he hath purposed in himself. So what's the mystery of his will? That the in the dispensation of the fullness of times he might gather together in one all things in Christ, both in heaven and which are on earth, even in him in whom we have obtained an inheritance. Now, in other places it's even, even more expanded. In God's purpose of redemption goes beyond even believers. His purpose is to restore his own purposes in creation, in creating man in his image. God is going to put all things together the way, the way they should be and repair the damage done by Satan and sin. In whom, in Christ, also we have obtained an inheritance, being predestined according to the purpose of him that worketh all things after the counsel of his will, that we should be to the praise of his glory, who first trusted in Christ, in whom ye also trusted, after ye heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation, in whom also you have believed, ye have believed, and ye were sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. So what is the predestination, and what is the purpose here that is God is working? The inheritance we have received is that we are joint heirs, heirs of God in Christ. That we should be called sons of God, and indeed be sons of God being predestined to this end, according to the purpose of him who worketh all things after the counsel of his will. He's working all these things together to accomplish his purpose in Christ. His purpose of salvation, his purpose of the redemption of creation itself from the disaster of Satan's rebellion and tempting humanity to fall with him. He is restoring all things to his own purpose. This was talking about, does this say anything about God decreeing all things? Whatsoever comes to pass? That God decreed the fall? God decreed every sin, every evil? Certainly God has determined certain things. But they say God has determined all things, all things whatsoever, in exhaustive degree, totally determined. So couldn't sinners simply say that, yes, I sinned, but you caused me to sin. You decreed that I do it, therefore I could do nothing other than that. You put the desire in my heart. See, that's what, how Calvinists get around some of this stuff. They say, God doesn't force you to act against your will. He just makes you willing to do what he wants. Well, which is worse? Physically forcing someone to do something against their will? Or altering their will to do evil? I would say the latter is a worse thing to do. So I'm not convinced by... Ephesians 1.11, as far as justifying the, uh, the claim of the writers of the Westminster Confession of Faith that the eternal decree of God, as they posit or dictate, is in fact taught by the Scriptures. Which means it comes from someplace else, not from the Scriptures. 
But they give us three more verses. Excuse me, actually four more verses. They also quote Romans 11, or reference Romans 11.33. So we'll go over to Romans 11.33. Oh, the depth of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. I would say this indicts them. So they say God did something in a certain way, and yet Paul says, uh, you don't really know God's ways. Hmm. But let's look at the context to see what Paul's talking about there. I don't see any mention of an eternal decree of all things at all there. No, nope, not there. Let's see. Let's see what Paul actually is writing about. Well, he's talking about the Jews, and he says, uh, verse 28, Concerning the gospel, they are enemies for your sakes, but as, touch, as touching election, they are beloved for the Father's sakes. So, what's he talking about there? Well, God made promises to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. That through, especially that, that, that through the descendants of Abraham would come forth the promised one, the seed, who is the Savior, Jesus Christ. Hmm. For the gifts and calling of God are without repentance. God promised, and God keeps his promises. For as ye in times past have not believed in God, yet have now obtained mercy through their unbelief. Now, do you remember uh, there's a certain time in Paul's life where he kept going to the synagogues and the Jews were hardened against him? And he finally reached the point where he said, from now on, we're just going to go to the Gentiles because you won't believe the gospel. So the majority of Israel rejected the gospel. They rejected Jesus Christ as the Messiah. Some people teach that uh, God, Jesus, offered them the kingdom and they refused it. On the contrary, there was a time when they were going to take him as by force and make him king, and he hid himself. There's so many people out there that pretend to be biblically knowledgeable and would teach others and don't know the scriptures. Not well enough to teach. We all err in many things. Even so as these, the Jews, uh, the majority of the Jews, have not now, have now not believed that through your mercy, in other words, through the mercy shown to the Gentiles, they also may obtain mercy. For God has concluded them all in unbelief, or put all in, under unbelief, that he might have mercy upon all, both Jews and Gentiles. As he says in many other places, like 1 Timothy Two four God Christ died for the sins of the whole world that He might have mercy on all. That was the purpose of that. The gospel is for every person, not just the elect. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God! How unsearchable are His judgments! and his ways past finding out. Talking about what? God's mercy in Christ to both Jews and Gentiles, and how he's using the despised Gentiles to make his mercy known to the Jews. Paul, in another uh, place, talks about that, that the Gentiles might provoke the Jews to jealousy 
that God is, is saving them and they received the very Spirit of God, they received the promise of the new covenant, and yet they're trying to, you know, what, what they're trying to obtain through their own righteousness is given freely to the Gentiles. God's wisdom. Both the, the riches, both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. That's what he's talking about there. Salvation. Not only of the Jews, but of the Gentiles. God's wisdom and his judgments. Past finding out. Hmm. Where does it say anything about an eternal decree there? <sighs> For who hath known the mind of the Lord, or who has been his counselor? Or who hath first given to him that he should be recompensed unto him again? It is God who gives. Good things come from God. Salvation is indeed of the Lord. And he has decreed that it should be a free gift through faith in Jesus Christ. That's a decree of God. And it's a gift that is available to all, which is why his son died for all sin, not just some sin. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Amen indeed. So, in verse 33 there of Romans 11, Oh, the depths and riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. How does that prove the eternal decree of all things? I do ask. They are asserting that's proof? Of their teaching, their doctrine? They have to do better than that. That's shameful. That That is, what that reveals, if they actually believe that proves that, is they are demonstrating their utter failure to understand Scripture. Their utter failure to even read Scripture in context. Their utter disqualification for being teachers and instructors of God's people or of the ignorant and foolish They're disqualifying themselves. Well, we have two, three more verses. Hebrews. One is actually two verses in one chapter. Hebrews 6, 17. We'll give them an opportunity to perhaps redeem themselves. <sighs> 6, 17 of Hebrews. Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of the promise the immutability of his counsel or plan. That word there means his plan or purpose. Confirmed it by an oath. Well, that's talking about Abraham. Uh, so how is that? So talking about an immutability of his, his plan. It, does that say the eternal decree of all things? Well, in the Calvinist mind, yes. But scripturally, does it actually say that there? Ha, ha, ha. Let's go up to verse 13. Who is God talking to and about what? Context, context, context. This is really an exercise in how to read the Bible. Somebody should have instructed them, the Westminster Divines, in how to read Scripture. Uh, it was actually, in that day, it was a pretty new thing. I mean, the, the Bible was, well, not well known. <laughs> Let's put it that way. In spite of all the efforts of Win, uh, William Tyndale, he was burned by who? Uh, the, the English government and the church. The English church, yes, they burned him at the stake for printing New Testaments in English. For when God made promise to Abraham, 
Because he could swear by no greater, he swear by himself. How can you swear by anything greater than God, right? Saying, surely, blessing I will bless you, and multiplying I will multiply thee. And so, after he had patiently endured, he obtained the promise. Abraham obtained the promise. He was given a son, Isaac, the proper son, not Ishmael. For men verily swear by the greater, and an oath of, for confirmation is to them an end of all strife. Again, I'm using the King James because that's what the Westminster Divines would have used. Wherein God, willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, the heirs of promise. Now, Paul makes it very clear that we are all sons of Abraham. All believers are sons of Abraham because we are sons of promise. Abraham was counted righteous because he believed God's promise. So also all the heirs of salvation are regarded as righteous because we believe in Christ through faith. It was through faith Abraham was regarded as righteous and so also with us, the heirs of salvation the heirs of promise, the immutability of his counsel. That word there means plan or purpose. God's purpose to save, to multiply Abraham, and through Abraham to bring the promised Messiah into the world, the seed, singular, of Abraham, the promised one. Paul talks much about that. Who have, <clears throat> inter confirmed it by an oath that by two immutable things in which that it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, encouragement, hope. Who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us which hope we have as an anchor for the soul, sure and steadfast, and which entereth into, uh, entereth into that within the veil. Christ is the one who, it truly the high priest, who entered into the Holy of Holies and purified our sins, not with the blood of goats and bulls, but with his own blood. Whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus, made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, the author of Hebrews goes on and explains all this. But where, in verse 17, is the eternal decree, the immutable et eternal decree of all things? Now, this is God's plan of salvation. Hmm. I have to say, that's another strike. They're just about struck out here. So let's go on. We have Romans 9, 15, and 18. Why did they skip the verses in between? 15 and 18? This supposedly proves their assertion of an eternal decree of all things which is a real thing. That's a statement there that God did from all eternity. God from all eternity did, excuse me, by the most wise and holy counsel of his own will freely and unchangeably, immutably, ordain whatsoever comes to pass. Everything. Good, bad, and ugly. That's what they're saying. Everything. The rape of a child. And the murder of a child. God ordained it for his own glory and good pleasure. Hmm. Um, where does the Bible teach that? We're giving them the chance to justify this assertion themselves from their scripture references. They say these verses prove the assertion they made 
in Chapter 3, Paragraph 1. Hmm. The first clause. These are the references for that first clause that I'm just dealing with here. If that clause doesn't isn't proved by the Bible, the rest of that uh, uh, paragraph is meaningless anyway. So let's go over to Romans 15. Let me go back there, tell you again. Romans 15, chapter 3, God's eternal decree, paragraph 1. The last reference is Romans 15 and 18. 15 and 18. For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I have compassion. Verse 18. Therefore hath he mercy on whom he has mercy, and whom he will harden, and whom he will he hardeneth. Um, okay, so how does that apply to an eternal decree of all things? That God is sovereign and he can do things the way he wants to do them within the limits of his own nature. Is it in the nature of God to decree evil? Isn't, isn't he the God that is love? that gave his own begotten son to save sinners? Hmm. Let's go up and see what Paul's talking about in chapter 9. Of course, the chapter divisions aren't actually in the original text. So, at the top of this chapter, he's saying, and he'll pick up this again in chapter 11. In between, he actually talks about how a person is saved in chapter 10. I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost, that I have great heaviness and continuous sorrow in my heart, for I wish, for I could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So he's saying here, I, you know, I'm so concerned, I see my fellow Jews not believing, and if it were possible, I would give my own salvation that they might be saved. Of course, that's not possible, but he's just ex expressing his, his anguish that they are not believing the gospel. Whom are Israelites, whom, to whom pertaineth the adoption, the glory, the covenants, and the giving of the law, and the service of God, the, the worship service, and the promises. Whose are the fathers, of whom, as concerning the flesh, Christ came, came from them, as, as of the tribe of, of uh, Judah, descendant of David the king, who is over all, God bless forever, amen. Christ is over all, God bless forever, amen. Not as though the word of God has taken none effect. This is the context. Why? are so many Jews not believing in Jesus, the promised Messiah and Savior, who is Lord and God. Why are they not believing? They're the descendants of Abraham, of Isaac, of Jacob. Why are they not believing if he really is the Messiah? Aren't they supposed to receive him? Why? Paul says, for they are not all Israel, which are of Israel. Just because you're born of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, according to the flesh, doesn't mean you're God's Israel. You're not of God. Why? Because it's, as in the next chapter, we find out it's those who are of the faith of Abraham who believe in Christ. We are saved by faith, through faith in Christ, not of works neither because they are the seed of Abraham are they all children. But in Isaac shall your seed be called. That is, well, Isaac was what? He was promised, the promised one. That is, they which are uh, the children of the flesh, these are not the children of God, they're not children of God simply because they are 
of the flesh descendants of Abraham and Isaac and Jacob, but they are the, that is, they are the children, uh, the, they which are of the children of flesh, they are not the children of God, but the children of the promise. Isaac was the promised one. Remember, God, even though uh, Abraham and Sarah kicked up a plan, uh, kicked, uh, cooked up a plan to fulfill, fulfill God's promise that Abraham would have an heir. That was not God's plan. God's plan was to wait until Abraham and Sarah couldn't do it naturally by the flesh because of old age. And then he said, now, a year from now, you will have a child. And you'll name him Isaac because Sarah laughed at the thought. And this is a word of promise. At, at this time I will come, and Sarah shall have a son. And not only this, but when Rebekah also had conceived by one, even by our father Isaac, for the children uh, t conceived two, Esau and Jacob, both in her womb, for the children being not yet born, neither having done any good or evil, that the purpose of God's, God according to election might stand, not of works, but of him who calleth, it is written of her, the elder shall serve the younger. Yes, this was spoken by God before they were born. The elder son, Esau, will serve the younger son, Jacob, contrary to normal tradition. The blessing goes to the eldest. Well, Esau despised God and sold his blessing to Jacob for some stew, some lentil soup. Beans, a bowl of beans. That's all Esau thought of the blessing that was due the firstborn. That's all Esau thought of the promises of God. As it is written, Jacob have I loved, but Esau have I hated. This was not spoken before they were born. This is spoken because Esau despised his birthright and Jacob desired the blessing of God. That is why that scripture is written that way. Jacob believed God. Esau didn't. That was not predetermined. Go back and read the story. That was a result of Esau's actions. Esau's attitude, Esau's unbelief in God. And Jacob, though he was a scoundrel, desired God, desired the blessings of God, and received them. What God did determine was that the younger would get the birthright, not the older. That doesn't mean he determined the actions of Esau and Jacob. He just determined the outcome. Don't go beyond what is actually said. Let's see, what, what's the other verse then? So that's, that's verse 15 then. Uh, no, we're not quite there. What shall we say then? Is there unrighteousness with God? Injustice? God forbid. For he saith unto Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. Let us remember, in Romans here, back in the beginning, what does he say? For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. God is dealing with guilty sinners. He's under no, his justice is under no obligation to save them at all. 
So he chooses to have compassion in this case and d d decide, well, I'm going to, in order that it might be by my choice and not man's tradition, I'm going to determine that I'm going to end up blessing the younger of these two twins. But it was Esau that despised God. And that's why he was hated by God. So then it is not of him that willeth, nor of him that runneth, but of God that showeth mercy. Yes, salvation is of the Lord. If it wasn't for God's grace, we would all be in hell. Because that's what we deserve. We have all sinned. Not because God decreed us to sin. In fact, it, in God's plan, yes, he has shut up all under sin for a purpose. What is the purpose? For his own glory? No, that he might have mercy on all. That he might have mercy on all. And that's why Christ died for the sins of the whole world. That God might show mercy to anyone who will believe in Christ. Not simply the elect predestined. See, in the Calvinist system, the, the decree determines salvation. The eternal decree determines all things. Exhaustively. That is the true source of so-called salvation. So the, eternal, the, the, the same reason a person goes to heaven is the same reason another person goes to hell. Exactly the same reason. The eternal decree it has nothing to do with what they've done. The, the, uh, Calvinists refer to that as God's grace. His arbitrary choice of some for salvation and some for destruction. Arbitrary. Not because they sinned. God chose this before they sinned. Eh. I find that... Uh, not in concert with the God I know, the God who saved this poor wretched sinner from a well-deserved hell. So he, they just take those two verses that I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy and compassion on whom I can have compassion and that he uh, has mercy on some and others he hardeneth. By the way, when he hardened Pharaoh, the scripture says in verse 17, he's talking about Pharaoh here, uh, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh, even unto this very purpose, I have raised thee up, that I might show my power in thee, and that my name might be declared throughout all the earth. Uh, like um, Judas Iscariot, Jesus, God had selected an apostle that he knew would betray Christ. It was not that God made Judas do it. Judas himself was already set in that direction. He was a lover of money. He was a thief. So he fit the prophecy. He would fulfill God's words that one would betray Christ. He fit himself for that role through his sinfulness, through his greed, through his willingness to steal out of the, out of Je the, the money bag, the do donations that were given to Jesus and his apostles, to steal out of it. He prepared his own destiny. And that's why he was chosen, because that's the kind of guy he was, to fulfill God's word. Now you notice the scriptures don't say that a man named Judas Iscariot will betray Jesus, not one of his companions. God had a plan. God said this will happen. And then it happens because certain people fit themselves into God's plan.
So God indeed is sovereign, but does he, the, the, what they are asserting is that God decrees all things exhaustively. Do any of these scriptures say that? Not a single one. Not a single one. So all I can say is the Westminster Divines, the authors of the Westminster Confession, did not get their doctrine from the scriptures, but somewhere else. And the very fact that they try to foist these verses on us as proof of their false doctrine condemns the Westminster Divines as frauds, as false teachers, as unable to properly read God's Word. Well, if they're unable to properly read the New Testament, why would we believe anything they tell us? They condemn themselves by their own claims, by their own misuse of Scripture, saying that those verses prove the eternal decree of all things, disqualifies them from ministry. Guilty of abuse of Scripture. Guilty of teaching false doctrine. Guilty of using the power of government to foist false teaching on the people of England and Scotland. 